Hi everyone, my name is Michael and I'm a research scientist at Vitrive. Here I specialize in AI development and evaluation. In this webinar, I'd like to talk about embryo selection with artificial intelligence or AI. And specifically, I'd like to cover how we evaluate AI models and how they can be compared against each other and against current practice in IVF clinics. In the past few years, we've seen an increasing number of studies, including AI models for embryo selection. And the use of AI and machine learning has introduced a new language into IVF that not only data scientists, such as myself, but also clinicians have to understand. And this includes a variety of metrics that are used to evaluate the performance of these models, such as accuracy, informedness, F1 score, and AUC. And today, I hope to demystify some of these terms and most importantly, relate them to actual clinical practice. And to give you an overview of my talk, I'd like to start with a brief introduction to what artificial intelligence actually is. Then I'll go through some of the main topics of our paper that was recently published in the Journal of Assisted Reproduction and Genetics. Here we reviewed 13 past studies that used AI for embryo selection. And I'll use these as a basis for going through a number of issues related to the development, but especially also the evaluation of these AI models. First, I'll talk about the data foundation. So what type of inputs and outputs there are and what population of embryos that are typically being used. Then I'll walk you through the most common evaluation metrics and describe their strengths and weaknesses. I'll then talk about model comparisons and specifically focused on human versus AI comparisons on embryo selection, as they involve an inevitable selection bias. And lastly, I will summarize some of the main points to be aware of when reading AI studies as a short checklist. But as I said, I'd like to start with a brief introduction to what artificial intelligence or AI is. And here I have borrowed an illustration from an AI review paper that came out earlier this year, from Michael Riegler and colleagues. And this illustrates quite nicely how AI is used in a variety of domains, uh, such as computer vision, speech recognition, robotics, and language processing. But what's common for all these domains is that they typically use some sort of machine learning. That is a data-centric approach to reason about something. For instance, classify or predict the quality of an embryo. And contrary to normal programming, Machine learning algorithms automatically learn patterns from data and uses those patterns to generalize to new examples. Now, the term machine learning actually has existed for half a century, and many of the traditional methods actually date back to the beginning of the 20th century. The term deep learning, on the other hand, was introduced in 1986 to describe a specific subset of multi-layered artificial neural networks. But today we often mark the year 2012 as the beginning of the deep learning revolution that has transformed the AI industry, especially in terms of image recognition. The following figure, also from Michael Riegler, illustrates a number of steps required to develop an AI model for fertility clinics. And the first step is to define a relevant aim for the AI model. So should it try to mimic a process that the embryologists do in current practice and automate this, or is it a decision support tool that should guide practitioners to make better decisions? The next step deals with data collection and storage. And because this includes patient data, we have to ensure both data security and data privacy, uh, potentially by anonymizing or removing sensitive information. Then we typically split the data set into training, validation, and test subsets, such that we develop our AI model on one part of the data set and test it on another independent part of it. And we then build the model by training it on all the labeled examples in the training set using machine learning. And after that, we can then test the model to make sure that it generalizes to new and unseen examples, and possibly even a new clinic as well. And finally, after rigorous validation, we can implement the model into the clinic. Before diving into the specific research area of embryo selection, I'd like to mention the tripod statement because prediction models, such as AI models, for instance, they are quite common for a variety of clinical domains, not just IVF. 
And luckily, there already exist some comprehensive guidelines uh, that describe how to report these models, namely the tripod statement. And if you're interested, tripod provides both a checklist and an extensive explanation of items that are relevant to most clinical prediction models, including all embryo selection models. So I definitely recommend that you have a look at that if you're ever participating in an AI study yourself or evaluating another model, for instance, on your data. So in our paper, we reviewed 13 studies that all used pregnancy-related outcomes to train and evaluate AI models using image data. And this means that all, all were embryo selection models were based on image data with the same goal of choosing the embryo most likely to result in a pregnancy or live birth. However, as you can see on this table, they were still remarkably different in terms of their data inputs, their pregnancy outcomes, embryo populations, and reported performance metrics. And for this reason, we cannot compare them directly, even though that would be nice. And in the following slides, I'll go through each of the columns in this table and discuss its relevance in terms of model development, model iteration, and clinical practice. And I'll start with the data input. Because as you can see in the table on the left side, the input data by, used by AI models vary quite considerably between studies. And first and foremost, you can see that some studies use a single static image of an embryo, typically at the blastocyst stage. And these typically arise from embryos incubated in benchtop incubators, where the images are then acquired using a traditional microscope. Other studies use time-lapse videos resembling the entire development pattern of an embryo. They have the ability to learn time-dependent patterns, or so-called temporal features, that may turn out to be predictive factors of pregnancy in addition to the static morphological features, as we know them from the Gardner score, for instance. And because an image is two-dimensional, whereas a video is three-dimensional, the AI models used to process these can be quite different. But apart from the use of static images or time-lapse videos, we also see studies that use additional inputs to the AI model, such as patient age or lab settings, for instance. And this could be valuable, to, for instance, to predict the actual ch chance of a pregnancy, because we know that depends on age and other patient factors. But it also affects some of the evaluation metrics, because AUC, as I'll come back to, is often used as a performance metric of an AI model across the entire embryo or patient population. And patient age in itself can actually result in a fairly good AUC because it separates the young, good prognosis patients from the elder, poor prognosis patients. However, as embryo selection is all about selecting embryos um, from a single patient, such AUCs don't really reflect the clinical performance. And therefore, when reading AI studies, you should always be aware of what type of input the AI model was given. Does the input make sense? And if two studies do, have the same uh, do not have the same type of input data, as in this case, they are not really comparable. So once we have established what type of data is needed for an AI model, the data set is first collected and stored, as I mentioned above. Then we typically split the data into three subsets. One part is used for training the model, another smaller part is used for validation, and the last part for testing the model. And the validation set is kind of specific for machine learning and AI models, because they'll often tend to overfit the training data, which means that they'll try to, to recognize or remember all the individual training examples, but not really generalize to new examples. But by using a validation set for continuously measuring the generalization performance, we can prevent this problem. But how, how to perform the splitting, this splitting into training validation and test is not standardized. And the percentages that I've written here is just one example of how the distribution might look like. The reality is that a number of parameters affect how we should split the data. So first, there's the level of splitting. Do we split the data set at embryo, patient, or even clinic level? If we split the embryo at embryo level, the, we split uh, the data set at embryo level, then some embryos from a specific patient may end up in the training set, whereas others may end up in the test set. 
And this could actually bias the results because the AI model may somehow have learned how to recognize the specific patient. So in general, the data set should therefore be split at patient level. But if we are specifically focusing on generalization performance to new clinics, we could also allocate different IVNF clinics into each of the training, validation, and test subsets, or different microscopes for that sake, if the model should generalize across input devices. Now, next, there's the type of splitting. Normally, we just take a random subset of embryos and use that for testing. But there's actually a stronger approach that can eliminate certain types of biases in the results. For instance, we can use the nearest data for testing the model. That way we force the model to generalize across time and prevent historical biases in the test set. Similarly, this could be done geographically if we specifically want to measure geographical generalization performance. The third parameter is stratification. And this means that we split the data set such we get the same ratio between positive and negative outcomes in each of the three subsets. This is often used together with random splitting. And finally, there's cross-validation. Cross-validation is used for, typically used for smaller data sets as a way to increase the certainty of what is measured in the validation set. And this is done by training multiple similar models with different validation splits. Now, when you read scientific papers on clinical prediction models that are not based on AI, you'll often find a slightly different terminology than, not than the notation of a training, validation, and test set. Often papers will distinguish between a development set and a validation set. And this is actually the general guideline for how to report these models as described in the tripod statement. Unfortunately, this terminology is not just different, but it's actually conflicting. Um, as I've shown here, the development set contains both the training and validation set that I described before, but in Tripod, the test set is called the validation set. And often we refer to the test set as an internal validation, because this is the test that the authors of an AI model perform themselves, on the, typically on the same data distribution that the model was developed on. However, if a new clinic um, adapts the model and evaluates the performance on their independent data, this is referred to as an external validation. And that's a somewhat stronger relation because it's less biased. The final topic that I'd like to uh, cover related to the input is about data balance. Because as we know, uh, IVF data are often unbalanced. It's common to see a success rate or a so-called prevalence uh, of around 30% overall, which means that the data sets are unbalanced. But how this affects AI models and their relation is not trivial. Some papers claim that we should balance the data sets before training and evaluating, but it's unfortunately not that simple. We actually have to distinguish between training an AI model and evaluating it. So when we train an, a model, unbalanced data can be a problem because the model may learn a lot about all the negative examples and less about the positives. But there are different ways to handle this, for instance, by oversampling the positive outcomes. And this means that we basically just replicate the positive examples such that the AI model sees an even number of positives and negatives when it's training. During erosion, on the other hand, Artificial balancing is generally not recommended, but we should be aware of any unbalance in the data when we are evaluating uh, so-called prevalence-dependent metrics, because metrics such as accuracy and positive and negative predictive value all depend on prevalence. So the results will actually change if we balance the data set. The next column in our table is called outcome. And it's related to whether we train and evaluate AI models on, for instance, early pregnancy results or live birth, but also which subgroup of the embryos we are actually using. So imagine that we have eight embryos um, after five days of incubation from a single patient. Some of these may have degenerated and not reached the blastocyst stage. So we might choose to discard these. Then we may choose to make one fresh transfer of the best looking blastocyst uh, and then freeze the remaining ones for later usage. 
In this case, the first transfer resulted in a negative pregnancy test. So we thaw the second best looking embryo and transfer that one. That gives us a positive pregnancy test in this case, but no fetal heartbeat. And this process they may then be repeated until at some time we get a positive pregnancy and in the end, a live birth. If we look at the studies from our table, we see different studies use different endpoints. And let's take fetal heartbeat as an example. So when we evaluate an AI model's ability to predict fetal heartbeat, we typically forward propagate the negative outcomes so that a negative pregnancy test also gives a negative fetal heartbeat. And likewise, we can back propagate the positive outcomes so um, that a positive live birth uh, gives a positive fetal heartbeat, even if that wasn't actually measured. And when comparing studies, we need to make sure that these assumptions were done exactly the same way. Otherwise, they are not comparable. And we should also consider, consider potential biases, such as loss to follow up. Because it's easy to assume that a negative fetal heartbeat doesn't give a live birth. But what about the positive fetal heartbeats where we don't know the live birth results? There we can't assume anything. And this may actually introduce a bias that is specifically relevant when we measure calibration performance. And to complicate things even further, all of this is actually only valid for single embryo transfers. If we include multiple embryo transfers, we only know the actual outcomes of each of the embryos if either all the transferred embryos implant or they all fail to implant. And if we neglect all the remaining treatments where only some of the transferred embryos implanted, we introduce a bias. And again, this is specifically relevant when measuring calibration performance, which I'll talk a lot about later. In our paper, we came up with an example scheme for how to report embryo population and outcome. Because AI studies and their results are only comparable if they are conducted on the exact same embryo population and outcome. And as an example, the embryo population may be described by the insemination methods used, so IVF or ICSI, um, the number of incubation days, for instance, five days of incubation, and the sub-cohort, which could, as an example, be euploid blastocysts only. So we did this for the 13 reviewed studies. And when we look at both population and outcome, we end up with two study pairs that could potentially be comparable. All of the others differ by either the measured outcome or the embryos included. And if, if we were to look at more population attributes, such as patient demographics and culture media, for instance, we may also see subtle differences between the studies that appear similar here. But let's just for a moment say that the blue and green studies represent similar embryo populations, but different data sets. Then, before we compare the four performances of these models, we should also take into account the sample sizes. And when we are talking about deep learning, we shouldn't actually focus too much on the size of the training set because different methods require different data sizes to train. So if by some miracle that you can train an embryo selection model using just 10 image examples, then that's actually totally fine, as long as you can prove that it generalizes. And that's where the size of the test set comes into play, because the size of the test set determines what claims of performance you can make. And that performance should then be reported with confidence intervals. The figure on the right here shows an AI model that was evaluated on similar test sets of different sizes. And here you can see that the standard deviation of the performance metric, in this case AUC, is quite high when the test set includes only a few hundred embryos. So by pure chance here, we could see a test set AUC of 0 0.75 in one study and 0 0.8 in another study without there being any difference between the AI models only the data sets. Again, I'd like to refer to the tripod guidelines because they state that in the absence of any direct comparison between two or more models on the same data, it is difficult to decide from all available prediction models which is potentially more useful. So the bottom line here is AR models cannot be compared across data sets. 
if we want to measure superiority of one model over another, we need to evaluate them on the exact same test set. And this brings us to one of the larger topics of today, evaluation metrics. If you look at the table on the right, you can see that among the 13 reviewed studies, 12 different performance metrics were reported. That's quite a lot, and it's extremely difficult to keep track of that many metrics. So I'd like to demonstrate how they are computed, what they mean, and how they relate to actual clinical practice. And I'll do this using the example from before uh, that was based on eight embryos from the same patient. In the example, we chose to discard two embryos. Uh, five were cryopreserved initially and one transferred fresh. However, as that resulted in a negative fetal heartbeat, as we saw before, a frozen embryo was thawed and transferred. And finally, after the third transfer, a positive fetal heartbeat was observed. So in most studies, the evaluation only considered the transferred embryos because we don't know what the outcome would have been uh, for the discarded embryos and embryos that are still cryopreserved. So we actually left with three out of the initial eight embryos from this patient. Imagine then what we have two transferred embryos from a second patient, both in this case with negative outcomes. When we then predict the outcome using an AI model as either positive outcomes and negative outcomes, we can construct a so-called confusion matrix. This shows the relation between the AI predictions and the actual outcome. So if we imagine the extreme case in which the AI model predicts negative outcomes for all five embryos, we can see that four of those are correct in this case, and one is incorrect. And because of this, we can fill out the confusion matrix with four true negatives, one false negative, zero true positives, and zero false positives. And this gives an accuracy of 80% because four out of the five predictions were correct. However, the sensitivity is 0%. And that's because none of the positive outcomes were correctly predicted as being positive. On the other hand, specificity is 100% because all the negative outcomes were correctly identified as negative. We can also calculate something known as the informedness, which combines sensitivity and specificity. And in this case, the informedness is actually 0%, meaning that the AI model hasn't informed us of anything. It's no better than random guessing. In this case, random guessing that uh, all embryos will be negative. In a less extreme case, the AI model might predict negative outcomes for three embryos and positive outcomes for two embryos. Again, this actually results in four correct predictions and one incorrect. So if we fill out the confusion matrix, we now get three true negatives, one true positive, one false positive, and zero false negatives. And this gives us the same accuracy of 80%, because again, four out of the five predictions were correct. However, the sensitivity is now 100% and the specificity is 75%. So this means that the informedness is also 75%, which means again that the AI model has actually informed us. It's better than just random guessing. So you can see from this example that even though the accuracy was 80% in both cases, uh, the two models are very different, which illustrates that accuracy is probably not the best performance metric uh, and not really related to, to clinical practice as well. And speaking about clinical practice, how would we actually choose between the two positive predictions? Which one should we transfer first? And similarly, what if all predictions from a patient are negative? Shouldn't we then transfer any of them? And the fact is, it simply doesn't tell us. And these are some of the problems with binary classification metrics. They're easy to evaluate and understand, at least if we talk about accuracy, but they're not that relevant in clinical practice. Therefore, instead of making binary predictions of pregnancy or not, we should provide continuous scores 
And actually, a binary prediction is just a thresholded version of a continuous score. So often, a threshold or a so-called cutoff of 0 0.5, so 50%, is applied as I've shown here. Predictions are then positive if the continuous score is above that threshold, as for the two positive predictions, and it's negative if the threshold, if the score is below that threshold. When we have continuous scores, it allows us to rank the embryos, that is, order them by descending scores. And that allows us to calculate a number of measures, sometimes known as model-wide metrics. In my opinion, they are closer to uh, closely related to clinical practice. And they are based on the entire range of possible AI scores, not just an arbitrary cutoff at 0 0.5, for instance. So before presenting these model-wide metrics, I would like to relate each of the metrics to prevalence. That is, how are they affected by unbalanced data? And as I showed before, accuracy indeed depends on prevalence and should therefore be compared to naive performance, say a model that always predicts negative, for instance. Sensitivity, specificity, and informedness, on the other hand, uh, are independent of prevalence or unbalanced data. And since the ROC EOC, or the so-called receiver operating characteristic, um, the area under that one, since it's based on sensitivity and specificity, it's also independent of prevalence. This means that we would still get the same AUC if we removed negative examples until the positive and negatives were balanced. However, both calibration, precision recall AUC and something called NDCG uh, all um, depend on prevalence. And that, that doesn't mean that we should balance the data set before evaluating them. In fact, if we evaluate calibration performance, we need to have a representative data set. So artificial balancing would be catastrophic in this case. In order to understand the model-wide metrics, we first have to introduce a score distribution or a histogram of AI scores. So if we take the highest scoring embryo, we can plot that as a single point into the histogram. It has a score around 0 0.65 and it's colored orange because it had a positive outcome. We can do the same thing for the next embryo, which had a slightly lower score and a negative outcome. And the last embryo from this patient had an even lower score. Now, ideally, we would make an evaluation on patient level, because embryo selection is all about selecting the best embryo per patient. Unfortunately, however, we typically don't have multiple transfer, transfers with different outcomes available for all patients. So it's not really feasible to do the evaluation on patient level. Instead, we aggregate over groups of patients, preferably similar patients, and combine their embryo scores uh, and outcomes. So in this case, we add the two embryos from the second patient, and imagine that we do this for 300 more patients. Then we actually get a score distribution for the positive outcomes and a score distribution for the negative outcomes separately. And once we have this distribution of scores from both positive and negative outcomes, we can introduce a threshold on these scores. So if we introduce a threshold at zero, we can calculate the discrimination performance in terms of sensitivity and specificity, and we can then plot that as a single point on the receiver operating characteristic, or the rock curve. And here we get perfect sensitivity, but we also get the, get the worst possible specificity. But when we change the threshold, we gradually introduce new points on this rock curve, which indicates different trade-offs between sensitivity and specificity. And this allows us to calculate the area under the curve, which is called the AUC. And that's a combined measure of discrimination. So how well does the model separate the positive from the negative outcomes? Now, the second model-wide metric called calibration is based on the exact same score distribution. But instead of applying a threshold on the scores, we now look at the ratios between the positive and negative outcomes uh, for each bar on the histogram. So if we look at the first bar, we see that 50 embryos had a score of around 0 0.1. Of these, nine were positive outcomes. So that gives us an observed success rate of 
We do this for all the paths in the histogram. And ideally, this, this should result in success rates that match directly the predicted scores. And if you look at the graph on the right, you can see this actually seems to be the case here, which also explains why there were no scores above 0 0.6. We simply don't expect to see success rates higher than that based on these embryo characteristics or images alone. In addition to these grouped observations, we can also visualize a flexible calibration curve. And this helps us illustrate in this case that the model is actually underestimating the chance of implantation for low scores and it's overestimating it for high scores. And in between where the curve matches the diagonal, we could say that we have good calibration. And finally, for visualization purposes, we can add the histogram onto the same plot so that all the information is contained in a single figure. Another discrimination metric that is sometimes reported is the so-called precision recall curve. Precision is also called positive predicted value, and it refers to the fraction of positive predicted samples that have possible, uh, positive outcomes. So that is how many of the embryos that were predicted viable by the AI model did in fact implant. Recall, on the other hand, is the same as sensitivity and it refers to the fraction of positive outcomes that were correctly identified as being positive. The interesting thing about precision and recall is that both metrics actually disregard true negatives. So the metrics don't describe the ability of the AI model to correctly identify non-implantable embryos. And in general, however, these should be taken into account as they are quite relevant in relation to minimizing the time to pregnancy and minimizing also financial and emotional costs in a treatment. But as for the rock curve shown before, the precision recall curve can be uh, is generated by gradually changing a threshold. So if we introduce a threshold at zero, we regard all embryos as positive, and therefore we get perfect recall or sensitivity. We also get a precision of 37% uh, in this case, which actually corresponds to the prevalence. So what was the overall success rate in this data set? When we change the threshold, we gradually introduce new, introduce new points uh, on the precision recall curve, which again indicates different trade-offs between precision and recall. In this case, precision gradually increases while recall decreases. For the highest thresholds, uh, we see some large jumps in precision, and that's because there are very few positive predictions in this range, and the precision therefore becomes noisy. Finally, the area under the curve, or the AUC, uh, in this case is around 46%. But whether this is good or bad is quite difficult to say because it depends entirely on the prevalence. So if the overall success rate had been higher, say 50%, we would also get a higher precision recall AUC. And again, this illustrates and, and highlights the fact that we cannot compare these metrics across data sets, and thus typically not across studies. The last discrimination metric that I'll cover today is a, a ranking metric called normalized discounted cumulative gain, or in short, NDGG. And it can be used to describe the ranking performance within a single treatment. As such, it's theoretically the most relevant metric because ranking within a single patient cohort is exactly what embryo selection is about. On the right side, you can see three examples of how the AI scores from three embryos uh, are ordered. If the embryo with the highest score gets a positive outcome, as in the first example uh, on the left, we get an NDCG of one, which indicates perfect ranking. But if the embryo with uh, a positive outcome is not the highest scoring embryo within the cohort, we get an NDCG below one, as in the last two examples. And ultimately, we can then calculate the mean NDCG over all patients to evaluate the average ranking performance of an AI model. And NDCG is quite suitable for evaluating an AI model's ability to predict pre-implantation genetic testing um, outcomes or PTT outcomes, for instance. And this is because there we know the ground truth of multiple embryos within each cohort. That is, 
PTT results are obtained in parallel uh, for all blastocysts, for instance. But for evaluating the AI model's ability to predict pregnancy outcome, uh, NDGG is unfortunately less relevant because pregnancy results are obtained sequentially. We don't transfer all the blastocysts, but only one at a time, typically until the first positive pregnancy occurs. And this means that there are only few outcomes available per patient. And since they have been transferred over a period of time, uh, there's also other factors such as endometrial receptivity, which may have changed over time. If we look at the general recommendations for how to evaluate clinical prediction models, um, the tripod guidelines state that two key aspects characterize performance of prediction model, namely calibration and discrimination. And to summarize, discrimination refers to the ability to differentiate between positive and negative examples, whereas calibration refers to the agreement between predicted probabilities and the observed outcomes. And in the 13 studies that we reviewed, 11 reported discrimination in terms of AUC. However, none of them mentioned calibration as a relevant measure. And this omission of calibration is actually in line with observations by Tripod that calibration is rarely reported for prediction models. And maybe it's because most researchers are unaware of how to do the evaluation uh, and how to interpret the results. So I'd like, therefore like to dive a bit further into the calibration aspect of the model and compare it to discrimination performance, because discrimination and calibration can be seen as two independent measures, because you, you can have good discrimination uh, with poor calibration, but also the other way around. And I'd like to demonstrate this using results from a study we did earlier this year uh, and presented in an oral presentation at ESRA. So in our study, we used a retrospective data set consisting of 18 clinics and nearly 15,000 transferred embryos with known outcome. As we wanted to study the generalization performance of AI models, we took out one of the clinics and used that for testing an AI model that was then trained on the remaining 17 clinics. And first we see the discrimination and calibration results when applying the AI model to the new clinic. On the left, we see an AUC of 0.72, which indicates a quite reasonable ranking performance. However, the calibration on the right is quite bad since there's a very poor correspondence between predicted probabilities and observed success rates. And this is actually quite common for modern AI models that are based on deep neural networks. We can, however, fix this issue by calibrating the model once it has been trained. And we did this in our case using a procedure known as plat scaling. So by fitting a logistic regression model based on the 17 clinics that were used for training, we can generate a curve that converts the original AI scores to become actual probabilities. And when we apply this scaling, we see that the calibration performance improved remarkably. We also see that discrimination performance didn't change at all. And that's because we haven't changed the order of the scores. So the ranking of embryos within each treatment is exactly the same as it was before. And as such, discrimination and calibration are two independent measures. Now, if we focus on calibration, it looks quite good from an overall perspective. However, if we split the embryos into three subgroups based on patient age, this unfortunately changes. Now we actually see quite poor agreements between predicted probabilities and observed success rate for all three patient groups. And this is actually a great example of why subgroup analysis are extremely important in order to reveal potential biases and generalization issues. Because some measures may look good from an overall perspective, but less so when we look at a specific subpopulation. And this highlights what we already know, that implantation potential does not only rely on the embryo characteristics, but also on patient demographics. So when we add patient age as an input to our calibration procedure, still using the 17 clinics from the training set, we now estimate three separate conversion curves, one for each of the three age, age groups. 
And when we apply this, these on the calibration graph from before, we see that, well, for women above 40, the model now seems to be calibrated quite well. However, for the younger women, uh, there wasn't much of a change. And this indicates that this specific clinic, embryo characteristics and patient age alone do not fully explain the implantation likelihood. Therefore, we might have to include clinical practice as well into the calibration procedure. However, doing so requires us to uh, use actual data from the clinic. So now we are not talking about pure generalization performance anymore, because we now specifically tailor the implantation likelihoods to the clinic. And we did this by splitting the retrospective data set from the clinic into 30% that we use for calibration and 70% that we use for testing. And instead of estimating the conversion curves on the training set, as we did before, we now use the data from the same clinic to, is, to estimate three new curves, as in this case. And when we apply these new curves, we see that now, finally, all of the three groups seem to be calibrated quite well. And you can clearly see how both the predicted probabilities and observed success rates of younger women exceed those from elder women, as we would expect. The last topic that I'd like to talk about today is about model comparisons, specifically comparisons between humans and AI, because these were quite popular for the 13 studies that we reviewed, uh, as you can see in the table on the right. However, they are also prone to a selection bias, meaning that the AI model may appear superior to humans, even when it's not. And this happens because all the 13 AI models that we reviewed were evaluated based on retrospective data. So that is a data set that was collected previously and where the decision to transfer was made by humans. So the bias arises when we compare humans and AI on a subset of transferred embryos that was also selected by the humans. And the theory behind this is a bit complicated. So I'll start with a simple case to illustrate how the transfer strategy affects the performance that we measure retrospectively on previously transferred embryos. So imagine that we have 100 embryos that have been graded uh, on morphology, for instance, uh, into three separate qualities, good, fair, and poor blastocysts. If we transferred all of these, we could get a distribution of positive and preg negative pregnancies that looks like this. And based on this, we can generate a receiver operating characteristic. And since we have three distinct quality groups, good, fair, and poor, there are also three possible thresholds corresponding to the three points on the curve. And the AUC is 0.78 in this case. However, we would never transfer all embryos. Of course, we would start with the best ones and then possibly also have an internal threshold under which we would never transfer an embryo. So imagine for simplicity that we transferred all the fair and good embryos, but not the poor ones. This would mean that there are no, now only two quality groups among the transferred embryos, and the rock curve will resemble that. And the AUC has now decreased to 0 0.59 because it's more difficult to discriminate between fair and good embryos than between poor, fair, and good embryos. And in the most extreme case, if we only transferred the good embryos, now, since there's only one quality group among the transferred embryos, then there's actually nothing to discriminate upon. So this means that we would get an AOC of 0 0.5, corresponding to random performance. But remember, it's only because we are looking at a very narrow subset of the embryos. So the grading hasn't changed, but the AOC we get on previously transferred embryos indeed depends on the selection criteria used in the clinics. Now, imagine that we have an AI model that has scored the same 100 embryos with the following distribution for all positive and negative pregnancies. Again, if all embryos were transferred, we would get the following rock curve, which also gets an AUC of 0 0.78. This means that the two selection models, so embryologist and AI, are equally good. Another way to visualize this is to plot the predictions for each of the 100 embryos on a so-called scatter plot. So on the figure, on the right figure here, we have both the scores by model one, that's the embryologists, and model two, 
the AI model. And again, we see the same AOC for both models when we're looking at all embryos, 0 0.78. However, if the embryologist decided, as I said before, only to transfer the fair and good embryos, we will only know the pregnancy results for those two groups. That's a green area on the right. And because those two groups represent embryos of higher quality, it's more difficult to discriminate between them. And thus, the AOCs of both models drop to 0 0.59. Now, if the embryologist decided only to transfer the good embryos, the embryologist AOC on these will be 0 0.5, as I showed before. However, this is not necessarily the case for the AI model. Here, it gets an AOC of 0 0.60, which is considerably higher. So, it looks like the AI model is superior to the embryologist, even, when, even though we know that's not actually the case. We only see this performance gap because we are evaluating both models on a subset of embryos that was chosen for transfer by the embryologists. And that's a selection bias that unfortunately is inevitable when we do retrospective studies such as this one. In our paper, we extended this simulation and analysis to embryologist scoring uh, beyond the three groups of good, fair, and poor. For instance, some clinics may use a scoring system with continuous values, such as the KID score day five model, for instance. But even in this case, the selection bias is still there, and it turns out that the severity of the bias depends on the correlation between the embryologist scoring and the AI scoring. So if they are very correlated, as in figure D, then there's only a small bias in the measured performance. But if the two models are very different with a small correlation, then the bias is large as illustrated in figure B. As I said before, there's unfortunately not much to do about this, this issue when we evaluate on retrospective data. And therefore the only real solution that will eliminate this selection bias and provide a fair comparison is to carry out a prospective study. That is a randomized controlled trial in which both the embryologists and the AI model make decisions of what to transfer. So before concluding the webinar, I'd like to summarize some of the main points to be aware of when you are reading an AI study on embryo selection. And first of all, what is the purpose of the model? Is it clinically relevant or is the model predicting something that we cannot directly translate to actual decisions? Next, how large is the test set? As I mentioned earlier, we should focus, we should focus on the test set and not so much the training set. So are the performance claims reasonable? Are they, or are they based on a few embryos and thus quite uncertain? Then which metrics are reported? Do they fit the purpose? Um, and are both discrimination and calibration measures reported, as is recommended by the tripod guidelines? Next, does the study compare performances against other models? And if so, is the comparison done on a simpler, similar population and outcome, or even better, on the same test set? And is it a fair comparison? Or, do, or does it make some unreasonable assumptions about human performance, for instance? Related to this, is if the model is compared against human performance, be aware of this selection bias and try to consider if other biases may be present, for instance, due to artificial data balancing. Remember that calibration should, uh, should be evaluated on representative and non-balanced data, whereas something like accuracy may be misleading if evaluated on unbalanced data. And finally, does the study report generalization performance? That is. Does, it, uh, does the test set cover a diverse population of patients and IVF procedures? And is the performance reported on subgroups or maybe even new clinics or a new patient population? And these are at least some of the things to consider when reading and conducting AI studies. Now, to conclude the webinar, I'd like to highlight some of the main points from my talk today. And first, the introduction of AI models into IVF, it may be new and it may be somewhat unexplored, but how to evaluate the AI models or prediction models in general is not. Guidelines do exist for how to evaluate clinical prediction models. 
The tripod statement serves as a great starting point also when it comes to embryo selection. And in fact, a new variant called tripod AI is on its way, and hopefully that will also target some of the more AI-specific issues, such as recommendations for data splitting, sample sizes, and generalization analysis. I've talked a lot about performance metrics today, and I hope to have shown that there's clearly a lack of agreement on what should and shouldn't be reported. In my opinion, however, discrimination and calibration serve as the two main performance metrics that relate directly to the two tasks of ranking embryos and predicting their implantation likelihoods. My third point is about model comparisons. When reading IVF papers on AI and machine learning, performance metrics such as, uh, as accuracy and AOC are often compared across studies. However, such a comparison is only valid in theory uh, if the studies are based on the same embryo population and outcome. And because this will never actually be the case in practice, comparisons are, in reality, only valid when carried out on the same evaluation dataset using a paired analysis. And for that reason, I sincerely hope that we'll start to see public datasets emerging that can help us bridge the gap between AI models evaluated on all sorts of data subsets and clinical endpoints. But even then, when we compare two models on the same subset of embryos, there's still this possible bias due to the fact that we normally only evaluate on previously transferred embryos using retrospective data. So even when we can show on an independent test set that an AI model is superior to human embryologists in discriminating between good and poor embryos, even then, the results may be biased considerably by human selection, such that the AI model may not be superior in reality. And this is known as a selection bias. Other biases may also exist that hurt generalization performance of AI models to new clinics or new patient demographics. And this is something that's rarely evaluated and reported today, but in my opinion, deserves more focus. For instance, subgroup analysis could reveal potential biases related to a specific patient population, and external validations could provide a strong evaluation of generalization power. However, for model comparisons to be completely fair and unbiased, as I said before, prospective studies are eventually needed. And no matter which evaluation metric that we use, prospective studies are also needed to definitively determine any clinical benefit of introducing an AI model into daily practice. With that, I'd like to thank you all for watching this webinar. Uh, if you'd like to know more about the subjects that I covered today, I suggest that you read our paper published in the Journal of Assisted Reproduction and Genetics. And um, let me know if you have any thoughts yourself about good reporting practice and how AI models should be evaluated to reveal benefits in, uh, in clinical practice. Thanks again for your attention.